Adventures in Venture. Bastard, I can't fucking do that. <laughs> Okay, okay. I thought it was some audio thing. My chair just made a spoiling noise. Wait, uh, am I, are we, are we actually, do I just start? Is that what it is? Okay. Welcome to Adventures in Venture, where we talk about how developments in technology, business and science can be harnessed to create positive change in the world. On this podcast, I aim to help people understand how they can create positive change by looking at and deconstructing the habits and routines of the top performers in these areas. We'll be talking to people who have real world experience of starting and growing technology ventures, as well as scientists, angel investors, entrepreneurs, and venture capital investors. I'll also be talking about my own experience in raising a venture capital fund. So welcome, sit back and listen to the show. Hi, I'm Evan Maindonald. This is Adventures in Venture, and my guest is Gabriel Yarrison. Gabriel's a prolific investor. He's just raised his first venture capital fund. He's one of the highest rated investors in the Y Combinator network. He has the top YouTube channel on startup investing in France, and he's also an author. He's written two books, and, and in fact, his second book is being released today. So Gabriel, could you introduce yourself, please? Hey, Evan. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and chat with you. I mean, you've done most of the work, but I'll, I'll uh, fill in the blanks. So I'm Gabriel, uh, French, uh, as, you, as you've uh, said. I am um, firstly an engineer originally. I never worked as an engineer. Uh, after my engineering school, I was an entrepreneur for many, many years. I still consider myself an entrepreneur today. But I've raised, I've, sorry, started uh, many startups with um, very moderate success. I was still fortunate enough to have two exits as a founder and then turned to investing um, first, I started in 2017, what is today the biggest French angel syndicate, and then 2023 uh, started a fund called Lobster Capital. So that's me in a nutshell. How many startup investments have you done, Gabriel? That's a difficult question to answer because there's many, many different levels. So with the syndicate, with bigger check size, we've done, I think, 50, between 55 and 60 investments. But me personally on the side, I've been investing since 2013, so it's been 10 years. And um, once again, it depends on the amount. If you're talking about investments over $1,000, there's roughly 200 of them. But I've also used the crowdfunding platforms, the crowd equity to make investments, sometimes as little as 50 or 100 euros. And those are in the hundreds and hundreds, just because I'm so passionate about the space, I wanted to learn. And so I did, you know, yeah, hundreds and hundreds of investment in total. Okay, so it wouldn't be incorrect to say that you've, you've probably done a hundred or more significant size investments. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's a, that's a, that's an impressive record. So look, I think there's a lot of people out there who'd like to do what you've done, and um, I think raising your first venture capital fund is a is an impressive achievement, and particularly the speed at which you did you did it. You and I were on the VC Labs program together. You, I believe, were the were the were the first person to raise in the cohort that we were in. So yeah. that's <laughs> that's also. Uh, an achievement in and of itself. I'd like to understand or get to the bottom of what made you, you. And so what I want to start with is how you grew up and and where you grew up and how that formed who you are. So could you just maybe tell me a little bit about, about that, about how you grew up, where you grew up and, and how that formed who you are today? Sure, absolutely. So um, I grew up in the suburbs just outside of Paris, in a house with a garden. Uh, you know, my, my home was uh, upper middle class, probably. Uh, I was, you know, going on vacation every summer. And I'm the, the first uh, uh, son. Uh, I have two little brothers. And um, I'm not a, 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 a son of entrepreneurs. My parents were uh, employees. Oh, by the way, just tell us how old you are. Oh, yeah. So I was born in 1990. So I'm 32 today. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, not today, but I'm 32. I'm yeah. going 33 in a, in a few months. Um, and so, yeah, my parents weren't entrepreneurs, but they had, I think both of them, and still, still do, have um, uh, an entre entrepreneurial mindset, I would say. And by that, I mean, my parents always um, encouraged me to do whatever I wanted and to do projects. And by that, I, I, you know, to give you an example, uh, when I was, I think, 16, I was like, okay, I'm going to raise some money. I was, I, I was doing the, the, the Boy Scouts, right? And I, was gonna, I said, I'm going to raise some money and I'm just going to uh, uh, 
fund my own vacation. And there's just like, okay, do it. So it's not like they helped me do it or whatever, but there's like, uh, there's a lot of things that were allowed in the, in the, in the house. Yeah. Um, and so I think that really helped me. I, I, I was in, in those kind of, of things. Um, I'll give you another example. When I was 18, so you know, two years after that, I told my parents, uh, I'm looking for an internship for the summer in Hong Kong. Okay. 18. You know, most parents be like, what? This is too far. What are you going to do there? It's dangerous. You're only 18. And my parents were like, okay, have fun, honey, you know, be safe. And that's it. So with those things, were they your idea? Yeah. Where, where did you get the ideas from? I mean, where, how did they come to you at that age? Uh, you know, when you're 18, you want to travel the world. So, I, I, you know, I, yeah. Oh, but okay. Something, something else that I want to mention is my dad um, very early uh, had long business. So my dad is a strategy consultant expert and works with directly with CEOs of big, big companies in France to help them grow their companies faster. Very early, he was talking about his job with me. Yeah. Just talking about, oh, you know, I met the CEO and this is the strategy that we're putting in place to actually help the business. He had, he worked with some very, you know, big, famous French companies. And um, something, I was born in 1990. So when internet came around, let's say between 2001 and 2003, I was between 11 and 13. Right. It's exactly the age where I started, you know, be, be, becoming interested in this. And so there's a video of me that my dad shot because he thought it was amazing when I think I was 12 and I said, when I grow up, I want to be an entrepreneur. My dad was so amazed, I guess. He was like, who is this weird kid? So he filled me saying, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to do something online as, uh, on the internet. It was so brand new, but I already had realized that, you know, there were some opportunities uh, in terms of business, in terms of creating your own business. As long as I can remember, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I never ever considered following the traditional route of studying and just, you know, getting a job. Yeah. Um, so those are a few things. Do you want, I, I have one more. Do you want one more? Hold the thought. Sure. That's Hold okay. the thought. I'm going to come back to that. Yeah. I just want to ask you, do you think that was influenced by what you saw your dad do? For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, it's not impossible that he had the idea in mind telling me all that, yeah. oh, I'm going to kind of instill in him the idea of doing a business, etc. Once again, he didn't want me to be an entrepreneur because he wasn't one himself. Mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, he wanted to, to share his passion for uh, a, a strategy, for, for business in general, yeah. uh, on purpose to mold me, maybe, or just because he was passionate about it and I'm his son, so he wanted to chat with me about it. Yeah, yeah it sounds to me like he kind of put you into a general path, but then let you make up your own mind. So it's possible. You said you have one more thing. One, one, one more thing with computers. Yeah. When I was, I think, same age, 12, 13, around the, the times, as I said, uh, 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 internet was becoming mainstream. One morning, I m finally mustered the courage to go to my dad and say, I want a computer. <laughs> how, old you, how old do you think? 12, 13, wow. maybe 13. I want a computer. And it's been weeks that I'm thinking about it. I'm like, oh my, I'm so scared. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm shaking. Like, oh, he's going to say no for sure. I grew up with no TV allowed, no video games. Uh, you had to read books on top of the, the, the school books, like my, my parents would give me homework with books. Yeah. In the summertime, my, my, my dad would, you know, uh, uh, have me do uh, uh, next year's math and physics uh, 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 school program. Okay. So when I when came September, I already had done everything that I was going to do this year so, so, so that I was, you know, good in school. So I was shaking with the, with the computer thing. I was like, Dad, I want a computer. And I was like, sure, he was going to say, no way. We don't have TV in the house. There's nothing. And he looks at me and he says, yes. And I'm like, what do I say now? What do I do? So I, I, I ask him, I said, okay, when can we get it? Yeah. You know, I thought he was going to say next year or whatever. He looks at me and he says, let's go tomorrow. And the next day we went and got a computer. So that's also, you know, how, and, and I learned to code at 13. Just my dad gave me a computer and he said, have fun. And I, you know, did a lot of the stupid stuff with the computer, video games, downloading movies. It's illegal, by the way, don't do it. Uh, but also learning HTML, CSS, and coding and stuff like that, yeah. That's interesting. So you and I actually share quite a lot in that respect. Um, it sounds to me like your parents were very disciplined with you when you grew up. Yeah. And actually, my, my dad bought a, co a computer home for me when I was 12. And I oh. learned to program that computer, but at that time, there was no internet. Yeah. It was a thing called a Commodore VIC-20. I learned to program it, and I actually programmed a Space Invaders game. That's awesome. But I think there's something a lot of people who are 
in a similar position to us have have had that sort of experience where they've had a computer at a very early age and I think it forms it causes your brain to, to think in a certain way and it's more common in your generation than it was in mine um mm. I used to go up to uh the, my dad's work and feed punch cards into the mainframe computer with them so that, that was the point that, that the computer were when I was growing up but it is very interesting my parents were also very disciplined with me they they didn't they liked me to read books they didn't you know, they, they didn't encourage me to watch TV. They kind of limited my TV. And I do think that's good, actually, mm-hmm. for a, a child that's growing up because it helps you start to understand that um, maybe a slightly more disciplined approach to the world is one that will actually take you somewhere or take you to more interesting places. So, yeah, for that's sure. super interesting. Um, so... How did that lead into you doing what you are? So you you kind of had that background and that that um, growing up experience with your father. You got acquainted with computers and technology at quite an early age, and you learned to program them and did a lot of fiddling. How did that? How did you transition from that into actually starting to do an investment? Investment, the bridge comes from entrepreneurship. So as I, as I said very early from that age, I, I, I you know, play around with computers. I discover code. When I was 13, I coded a website that I sold to, okay. you know. Oh, that was your first business? It, it was, uh, you could say that in how, a sense. How, how old were you then? 13. And, how, and how, how, how much did you sell it for? 100 euros. <laughs> 100 euros, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, very early from that age, I decided I want to be an entrepreneur. And I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. For me, and I think I was super wrong to believe this, but for me, uh, you had to be extremely stupid to get a job. Mm-hmm. For me, getting a job was, so, I, I was very young, right? So this is the excuse that I'm giving myself. For me, it was not even possible to consider getting a job because I was like, okay. it's, it's, I'm, I'm never going to do that. There, there's another way that's better for me. And For me, getting a job was like failing. And if I was smart enough or good enough, I could create my business. That was the way I was thinking about it at the time. I today think it's a huge mistake because not everyone is is, is made to be an entrepreneur. Uh, And jobs, many jobs are super interesting. You know, it was a big cliche. I was young. I was like, jobs, employee, bad. Entrepreneurship, good. Of course, obviously life is much more nuanced. But that was my thinking, my young brain's thinking. And so very, very early, I was like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur for sure. So to answer your question, how did that lead to investing was through entrepreneurship. When I was a student, I started building my first businesses. Or you could say when I was 13, but, you know, when I became a student, I started building my first businesses. Yes. Do you mean student at university or at school? Um, University, mostly. University. So you went through school, you retained that interest. And so what did you study in university? Uh, Engineering. Engineering. Sorry. (laughs) It's like electrical engineering. Um, uh, computer science, computer science engineering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It is an electrical, uh, electronic uh, school, but it's a general school actually. So. so you didn't come out of university and take a job. No, nope. you came out and you went straight into entrepreneurship. Yes. I actually started even before I graduated. Right. So tell me about how you got started and what that transition was like as you came out of university. So it was good. Uh, how I started was someday I heard the school was paying someone three hundred euros per month. Mm-hmm. to take care of the school's social media. Uh-huh. And I go onto the Facebook page of the school and there's nothing. <laughs> and I'm like, there's a guy earning 300. And it, it was, I learned he was a student from my, from, from, my, okay. from my year, right? So he was still a student. He was making 300. So I go to the um, um, uh, communication uh, um, women of the school, right? The, the marketing person or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I tell her, Give me the 300 euros, but I'll ch- actually I'll post every day on the on the social on the Facebook page. Give it to me, okay? And she said okay. Yeah. So I made an enemy of the guy, right? Well, yeah. but but he was doing nothing. He was doing nothing. taking the money, right? He was so doing nothing. That's, that's called competition. Exactly. So I was a student, and then so I realized this is where my entrepreneurial brain came in. I was like, wait, the school is ready to pay me 300 euros per month to do this. There's got to be other people interested in doing this. So this was 2011 or 12. Um, and it was the big, the boom of social media. Everybody said, you know, SEO is dead. You got to be on, on Facebook and blah, blah, blah. I have a Facebook page, a Twitter account. So I guess at that point, you had already learned fairly well how to use social media because you, it was yeah. kind of a thing of your generation. Yeah. 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 So I was, oh, that's the thing. I, I've always been, also something that characterizes me is I'm, I, 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 I will touch at everything. 
I, so when there's social media, when every time there's something new, I want to understand it, I want to use it, I want to learn about it. So as soon as it came out, I, I became a top user of, of Twitter, uh, you know, very from the beginning. That's uh, how later on I came to be on YouTube. Uh, we'll talk more about that. But um, so I already was on social media already. You know, it's not like I discovered this. It was this new trend. Everyone was talking about it. I was like, okay, let me figure out what it is. How can I use it? You know, I had tens of thousands of followers already on my personal accounts. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it was easy to be credible with the, with, the, with the client to say, look, I've done it. Now I'll do it. I, I did it for free just for fun to explore. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, and I thought, you know, let me build my fo social following. I can always use it in my businesses. Yeah. So I realized, okay, this business, this school is ready to pay 300 euros. There's got to be other companies. I went to another company, said, you know, it's 300 euro. I'll do one post per day. Second company said yes, then third, fourth, fifth. So I was a student and had 10 customers. I was making 3,000 euros per month. Okay. And what I did, I hired an intern that I paid 500 euros a month. And I told him, take care of it. You do all of the posts. Okay. And so I was doing nothing, pocketing the difference, 2,500 euros per month, and just managing my intern. You were doing, you While were, in school. You were doing the same thing as the other guy, nothing, but, but mm -hmm. earning the money for it. No, exactly. I get it. Um, so that was my first. So that's interesting. And so did you take that business and continue to build it up? Or, or did you just kind of leave it at that and, and use it as a learning experience? For years, I kept it. Uh, I uh, added a lot of things. After social media, uh, I saw a lot of people uh, needed website developments. Okay. And so uh, being a computer science engineer, I developed a lot of websites as well on, on the site. It was making a lot of money, but what was... What was that is, it was not really repeatable. You sell a business, you sell a website, and that's it. It's a one shot. The, the, the social media subscription was recurring, but most people would unsubscribe after, like they would have my services for maybe six months. Yes. And they would stop just because it was actually, it actually wasn't worth it to put 300 euros. The thing is, everyone said social media is the next big thing. So everyone jumped on it and it was at the right place at the right time. But actually, it's not worth 300 euros per month. Um, I was doing a great job. They were having a lot of followers, but having a lot of followers, we know that today, doesn't really necessarily translate into dollars. Well, I guess also at some point, they might work out how to do whatever you were doing themselves, decide That's that they well. could actually just take it over and, and, well. and then... So, so you, you found that, that in that business, you had a, a lot of customer churn. Exactly. Effect, effectively. What did that business teach you about business in general? Ha, well, do something unique. There's so many competitors. So you know, I didn't have any pricing power. I was doing 300 euros. Then someone else was telling me, oh, this guy's doing it for 150. This guy's actually doing it for 80 euros per month. So do something unique uh, and have something recurring that lasts, that provides value to the client. If you sell something that doesn't actually provide value, the client is not gonna end up buying it for a long time. Yeah. Uh, so those were the first learnings. But also I was not passionate about it. Uh, it was a way to make a quick buck it was really, I stumbled upon it in my school. I was like, you know, I'm not going to turn the money down. Yeah. But I didn't really like it. It was always the same thing. That's why I gave it to an intern. It was so boring. Right, right. Every day tweet something about this guy who's doing, ah, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, gift ideas for men. Uh, it's, it's, it was terrible, you know. So anyway, yeah. Okay. So w where did you go from there? So then I started some, uh, that, then I, I, I went on holiday, um, on uh, uh, internship in Hong Kong. Right. And um, everyone said, oh, you're French, you should sell some wine. I was like, okay. Uh, and so then I came back, I was like, okay, I'm gonna open a wine shop in Hong Kong. Okay. I did a business plan and realized to open a wine shop in Hong Kong, you need 1 million euros because you need to find a place to buy the wine, to ship it to Hong Kong, to open, to pay the, the employees. So I was like, okay, let me start with a website. I know how to do websites. And then as soon as I make 1 million euro, you know, I thought it was gonna be easy. As soon as I make 1 million euro, I'll open the shop. So spoiler alert, I never opened the shop. But uh, my second business was a wine marketplace. So I was like, okay, what can I do differently? Everyone was selling wine. They go to the producer, they buy it, they store it. And then if you buy it on the website, they send it to you. As, and, you know, same thing, 2011, I think I started 2012. Um, ev everybody was talking about Amazon. Yeah. Jeff Bezos is the new king. It was growing like crazy. I think this is the first year Amazon was profitable, something like this. Everyone was talking about Amazon. I was like wait a minute, Amazon doesn't have anything physical. I mean, not everything. They have third-party sellers. They're just the platform. So why don't I do, today it's called drop shipping, but it didn't exist at the time. So why don't I do this with wine? So I went to wine producers in France and I said, well, I'm going to sell you wine. 
but you keep it in, on your property. And if I sell it, you ship it to the customer. Okay. Or direct from the producer. So there's a whole charm, like, oh, you're getting your wine directly from the producer himself. It's also better for the environment because it's only shipped once instead of going to a warehouse. Yep. Um, so that was the second business. A lot of learnings as well. What was that business called? It was called Le Vin de France. Le Vin de France. The French okay. wine, levindefrance.com. Okay. Uh, I had the domain name, levindefrance.com. Okay. So I was like, I got to run with this. It's cool. So you built that business up? Yeah. Okay. To what sort of size? Um, so out of 150 uh, wine selling websites in France, yeah. I was the 14th in size, okay. in size. And that's a couple hundred thousand uh, euros of volume per year. Okay. So what did you what was that business making in profit? Was it in profit? That's the thing. Right. Zero. Okay. The best year I did 4%. Okay. So that's a learning I, that's a, one of the best learning I from this business is not all businesses are equal. Yes. This th there's no margin in selling wine plus wine is very heavy and so shipping is by weight. Yes. So it's very expensive to ship and it breaks. Yeah. So you have insurance but you got to front the money because you got to, you know, someone has an event, the wine breaks, you got to ship it again urgently and the insurance is going to give you the money back in three months. So I know this business quite well. Yeah. I, I actually started a business importing New Zealand and Australian wine into the UK back in the there late 90s and, and set up an e-commerce website. And yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm familiar with that, that market. And it, the thing about wine that's quite interesting, it's a, it's a tr very traditional market mm. so, and, you know, well-developed, so margins are low. But I think it's also one of those markets, a bit like art, or like um, just the people want to be into, want to be in. Yeah. So people will do it without needing to make a lot of money and out of it because they just they just love it. So some some bits of the property market are like that. It's hard to make money because people just just want to be in it. They want to buy a particular property, so they're not looking at value. They're just looking at what they want. And so I can understand it would have been quite difficult to make money out of this, that business. Did yeah. you sell that, or what did you? Yes, do? Yeah. I was able to sell it. So. How much did you get for it? That's I'm not a liberty to say. I can okay. say off the sadly. Was it, the, was the, it a lot or a small amount? It was uh, in the middle. Uh, you know, I didn't retired, um, but I, I can tell you the amount. I'm not supposed to. There's a contract, whatever. But I don't want it to be online. But it, I, it's not like oh, I'm not going to work for ten years. Sure. But it's still a little bit of money that I could then uh, start to get to invest. You started doing your next thing, so it was worth doing, right? Yeah, exactly. It was for the learnings anyway. It was yeah. huge. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the and learnings. then, then what, what did you do after that? After that, I left to China. Okay. And uh, I was, so the thing is, I sold a business because I just wanted to get out of it. It was, I, I, I hated it. Yeah. And um, so, you, so by this time, you started two businesses that you ended up hating. Uh, the first one, I didn't hate it. <laughs> the first one, was, I was just, I was not passionate about it. Yeah. Okay. This one, I grew to actually hate it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I needed some fresh air. I was almost doing a burnout in, in, in Paris, always doing the business, growing, growing in revenue, but not growing in margins. Yeah. Uh, it was so irritating and painful. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, something that I haven't mentioned, but I try to mention every time is failing a business is super hard uh, uh, personally, because when you're an entrepreneur, you identify as your business. You're like, I'm the wine guy. I'm the social media guy. It's your baby, right? Exactly. And so when you're failing, it defines you. you, you're thinking, well, I'm worthless. I'm a worthless person because the only thing that I was doing ended up failing. So, I mean, I sold it, but I was not happy. It's not a huge exit, right? Yeah. So for me, it was still a failure because I had bigger ambitions. Right. And um, so when you're, it's so hard, you're really looking at yourself in the mirror and say, why did I fail? Because it's so painful. I don't want it to, ha to happen again. Mm. And so I needed to, a change of scenery. So I decided to, took, I took a one-way flight to Shanghai for two weeks from now. And I was like, let me, uh, uh, that's it. Let me change my life and just move to China. Right. That's, that was it. Was it? That must have caused you a few problems with visas and stuff like that. Yes, I had a 30-day visa, because <laughs> that's what it is in China, right? Yeah. And I had 30 days to find a job. It's like in the US, you need a job, okay. you need an employer to sponsor you. How old were you then? 25. Okay. 25. Um, and after 30 days, of course, I didn't find a job. Yeah. So I went to spend uh, 24 hours in Japan, yeah. then flew back into China. They gave me another 30-day visa. They're like, okay, try again. So after another 30 days, Finally, I still didn't have a job. Right. <laughs> so anyway, I went to Hong Kong, applied for a third visa. They didn't allow me for 30 days. They, t they said, okay, you can have two weeks. And then in those two weeks, I found a job, got a one-year visa, and was able to, to, to stay in China. What was that job? It's a job that I kept for two months. 
I was working as social media, social media slash um, SEO slash everything that I learned how to do in my previous businesses for a Chinese startup. And then what did you do after that? After two months, it was horrible. I quit. My visa should have been revoked, but actually it wasn't. Right. And so after, the, after you know, doing, being an, a, an employee for two months, I was like, okay, now it's time to get back into it. And I started another business. And what was that business? That business was a B2B e-learning uh, content producer. So it was an e-learning, uh, almost like an um, editor or a content creator. Okay. But also a website to sell back. So it was a platform. We were creating our own content right. in uh, the um, management soft skills for French companies in the French language. So it was okay. a French business, but I was doing it from China. Okay. So that is the business that you've just sold, isn't it? Yes. Right. So that you, you kept that business for a long time, and I guess it, it must have made some money over there. Yes. Yeah. Um, but why were you doing that in China? I mean, just because it's a different place to be? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just wanted, you know, to have fun. Shanghai is a very fun place when you're young and single. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to have fun. Yeah. I wanted, once again, Paris was very, it became very painful for me to stay here in my business, in my little routine, in the wine business that I hated, that I grew to hate. Yeah. So yeah, I just wanted to, you know, enjoy life. Okay. So how did you get from there to starting becoming an investor? How and why? I, 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 I was investing for a while at that point. I started investing in 2013. So as Okay, so you started investing while you were working on these businesses. You were yeah, taking the money that, absolutely. out of these businesses and you were investing it in what? In, in startups. Tech startups? Yeah, okay. tech startups. With any particular focus? No, anything I could get my hands on, which was not a lot at the time. Yeah. yeah. It was very few. But So when I, 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 when I was in engineering school, there was this uh, student... Uh, angel club no no sorry not student there was the, the school angel club yeah. and I applied to join when I was still a student but they said oh so by the way something to understand I inherited from my grandma mm -hmm. uh, when, at the, when I was a student uh, 30 grand okay. and instead of putting on a bank account I said I'm going to invest it in startups right um, and so I applied to join the club the angel club from the school and they say oh you can't you have to be graduated from the school to join okay <laughs> So one year later, yeah. I graduated and I applied. I was like, right. let's do it. Um, so immediately I uh, joined the club and this is how I made my very first investment in 2013. So 10 years ago. Right. And all the way while doing the wine business, while going to China, I was still investing on the side whenever I could, which was not often at all. Yep. But I was still trying to keep a foot in that area and invest whenever I could. Yeah. Okay. And I invested all of that money that I got, yeah. Right. And how many startups did you put that into? Well, I mean, my very first investment was 10K. So it was already a third of what I had. Then the, uh, I tried to make the other ones 5K. So that's four plus one, that's five in total. Okay. And do you think that you, how do you, how do you feel about how you allocated that? Well, it was not diversified enough, but my minimum check size was too high. That's actually why I ended up creating my syndicate was every time I was meeting a startup, the best case was they were allowing me to put in 10K, but sometimes it was 50K, 100K, which I didn't have. Right. And, and so I was like, how can I invest in the, I wanted to invest one, two, three, four K, and I couldn't, it was too small. So that's how I got the idea of a syndicate of saying, you know, if I want to invest 2K, but I've got 10 friends, then that, that's 20K. Okay. So that's how I got the idea. So you were in, China for a year and then you came back to two France years, two, two years, years. Yeah. Oh, two years and you then you came back to France yes. during that time you were running this training business online training business and you were also investing yes so, on my own on your own yeah and so you continued investing yeah. up until the end of that two years how many investments did you have by that point in total yeah. 10 okay. not even okay and then at the end of that two years you came back to France yeah. And then, is that the point at which you started the syndicate? Yes, okay, yes. tell us so about the, the syndicate. The last year when I was in China, yeah. I start, already started the premise of the syndicate. I, I started a uh, Facebook group. I, I met a few friends in China yeah. that had expat uh, contracts. So they had a lot of money. French people had a lot of money. And I told them I was investing and they said, oh, I want to I invest with you. So at that point, I created a small group on Facebook, an actual Facebook group. Yeah. I think there was, at the end, 12 of us at the beginning, five, six, with few family members, few friends from China, and few friends from France 
that expressed an interest in what I was doing. And I was like, guys, next time there is, a, uh, next time I'm investing, I'll share it with you. Right. We can all go in together. Yeah. And I tried to make a few deals happen that way. Right. So that was the premise of uh, everything else. So initially that group was like 10 to 20 people, basically, all, the, all people that you knew. Five, five to 12, it was 12 maximum. Really? Everyone I knew. Okay. Everyone I knew. Right. And uh, at that point, a few things happened. One is I read a book called Expert Secrets from Russell Brunson right. that the book said, you know, if you have a, an expertise on a, on a topic, you can make a business out of it. Yeah. So that's one thing. The other thing is I watched a webinar from a French YouTuber who said you can make you can make it big on YouTube even in 2017. You're late to the party, but you should publish one video per day for one year. Yep. And so when I came back to France, the the e-learning business was doing okay, but once again, I was not it was not growing as quickly as I had hoped. Yep. It was making money, I was paying myself. It was good. But I, you know, I had, I always had super big ambition. So I wanted something more. Yeah. And so finally, when I came back, I put the pieces together. I was like, okay, this angel thing, there's a lot of people who are interested. I want to try to actually monetize it and I can do it via YouTube. And so I started the business. I started the YouTube channel. I decided to post one video per day on YouTube for one year, yeah. which I ended up doing for two years. And that's how I got started. That's how, that, you know, 2017. Right. So you're back in France. It's 2017. You've got this Facebook group. So did you start to also, you started posting videos on YouTube and did you use that to grow the Facebook group? Yes, originally I did. You know what, I wasn't even sure, I didn't remember. But yeah, initially the Leon, the community was the Facebook group. Right. So, um, but very, very quickly I tried to monetize that. Okay. So I think I got the first two or three people for free. Okay. But then I said, if you want to join the group, the Facebook group, you got to pay. So it was a paid Facebook group initially. Yeah, it was free initially, but then it was... I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So free and then... How many everything. people did you have in the group when you started to monetize it? In other words, how many people were there when you started to make new people pay? Twelve. Okay, so not very many. No, yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I think I got one or... Twelve was my friends and, and stuff. I think I onboarded two, three people for free, so maybe 15. But after that, like, you got to pay. So how did, how did that work sort of mentally for you? You were like, I started this thing, it's to, it's to actually increase the... Because the purpose was to kind of increase your investment firepower That's in true. a way and enable you to participate with smaller amounts in, in deals. But how did you sort of transition from, okay, it's that. To, it's the book. I can monetize. I can, ah, yeah. right. So it's the book, Expert right. Secrets. Okay. Expert Secrets. So you read that book, you thought, oh, hang on a minute, I've got this thing, I can yeah. monetize it. Okay. The, the book says you have an expertise, you can make a business out of it yeah. on your own. And I was like, what's my expertise? It was pretty obvious. It was like, everyone kept asking me to invest in startups with me. Yeah. So I was like, I'm actually creating value for those guys. I'm not going to do it for free. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Very, I made the switch very easily. Interesting. So when you started charging people, how much did you charge initially? 500 euros per year. Per year. And did you have any resistance to that? Yeah. You did? Oh my God. So, so much. I, it was non-existent. I had zero deals done. The only thing I was said is, look, I've personally invested before and it's doing okay. Like it was, it was, yeah, uh, nine people out of 10 were saying like, oh my God, no, never, I'm not gonna pay. Okay, yeah, for sure. Where did these people come from? Were they from the YouTube channel? YouTube channel, uh, I did some advertising on Twitter. What were you doing? Like putting in mobile number out there? Because in those days... Um, capturing emails. Capturing the emails. So That's you're having a conversation over and then setting up a conversation or? Yeah, setting up a conversation or exchanging emails and stuff like that. So you got through like nine of these saying no? Did you, sure. were you starting to think, is this gonna work? A little bit, but like like I've said, I'm very persistent. Yeah. And I knew people were interested in to, to invest. Okay, you kind of got this, you got the interest signals, but, yeah. but you hadn't quite got to, I've closed. And then you must have been at some point you closed your first one. Yeah. How did that feel? Awesome. I mean, it's not, the, it's not like your first sale online. The very first sale online was when I sold my first bottle of wine. You know, yeah. you set up the website, you've been working for weeks and you, you don't even see the guy. Yeah. Just some money pops up on your account and like yeah. you made a sale. It's like the, the feeling is incredible. But I guess but, also at that point you knew it would work. Yeah, exactly. And so what well, exactly you, you know people are actually buying. So when I sold to the first guy, I'm like, it works. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's, you know, to be something cool. Okay. I didn't know how big it would become. I had no idea. Yeah. I thought it would make a nice you know, um, additional revenue on the side or whatever. I didn't know it would become a behemoth uh, in France anyway. But... I was, yeah, I was like, okay, it's possible. He's paying, he sees value. I knew there was value in it. Cause people, every time I was talking about it, people were like, oh, I want to invest. I want to do that as well. Share the deal. I knew the value was there. But yeah, the first guy who paid, of course, always kind of unlocks something in you, yeah. 
So that was back 2017. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about what's happened with that syndicate between now and then. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, I've had in total 700 people invest uh, with the syndicate. Uh, I grew the YouTube channel to 40,000 subscribers, which is still my main uh, acquisition channel for, for the investors. It's the largest French channel on that topic. Um, and from 2017, the, the be biggest change is, is from 2017 to 2020, we were investing in French startups because I was living in Paris. Okay. Every investment that I made in my life was in a French startup. Yeah. And literally overnight, I, I, as you can probably tell, I do understand English. And so one morning I woke up. I don't know what, what got to me. But one morning I woke up and I was like, wait a minute. Why am I investing in France where clearly the best startups in the world all congregate at the same place, which is called Silicon Valley? Yeah. Everybody knows this. So why invest in France? And so I, took a, I booked a plane ticket. Mm. to San Francisco and I was like let's go baby let's find a US startup to invest in that was 2020? yeah okay so in terms of the amount of income that you were getting from the people who were subscribing to your what, would you call them subscribers? to your yeah members but subscribers is members, yeah. members the members yeah. of your syndicate um, just tell me how, how that built up over those years from 2017 through to 2020 2020 really is the year that I exploded. So I was, you know, fortunate enough. The timing was exquisite for me. So just first year revenue, what, what was it like? I don't know, 20? 2017 was zero or like, you know, 1,000 uh, euros. Uh, 2018, I think I remember the numbers was 50K. Okay, so a lot. Not Something a lot. like that. But, but nice um, to have. 2019, oh, God, what's that? 2019 must have been 300k maybe. Okay, so starting to build starting up. To make, so you're yeah. starting to think, wow, this is something. That oh yeah, for sure. And then next year? And then 2020 was over 600k, I think. Wow. Yeah. And, and then 2021, 2022 was much higher. Right. I'll tell you off camera. Okay. It was much, much higher. <laughs> uh, okay, so that turned, I've told you before, that right? turned to what you have. That yeah. turned into a serious business by then. Oh, for sure. So the, the thing is, I was very lucky. Everyone who has success in business has a part of luck. Um, I was super lucky. Interest rates were at an all-time low ever. So people were looking for yeah, other no, we're, things. Yeah, we're in that do. free money period, yeah. Exactly. Money was free. Everyone was rich on crypto, wanted to yeah. invest in startup. Yeah. Uh, but also COVID, you know, I, was, I started in 2017, at the end of 2017. But 2018 and 2019, that's the two years where I published daily on YouTube. So I had, by 2020, seven, 800 videos on YouTube working for me. Because even if you publish a video, there's still people watching it weeks, months later. So everyone was stuck at home. Yeah. Everyone was on YouTube. Everyone had free money. Everyone went on my channel and said, oh, there's a crisis. There's an opportunity. I want to invest. So 2020, I exploded. It was crazy. Right. Yeah. 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 Because all those people were sitting at home watching web content, basically. Exactly. Um, so it was 2020. You went to Silicon Valley? Yeah. Um, when in 2020? Actually, first time there, I think it was December 2019. Right, so that was just before COVID hit, right? Yeah. Yeah, so did you stay for long or not? I mean, because I'm just thinking at some point, like March 2020, COVID would have come yeah. along and kind of... finished. By, by March, I'd been to San Francisco at least twice, maybe three times. Right, right. So I actually, so I started in 2019 to yeah. explore without going there. Right. So the, you know, the way I tell it is I went and that was it. No, I actually explored from home, from a computer, tried to um, um, have some contact there. Uh, the first investment I made, I hadn't been to Silicon Valley, but it was actually a French guy who was doing his business in Silicon Valley. I so started had, with the French. You had a contact out there. Yeah, uh, the, the French uh, mafia, you could okay. say. Uh, but very quickly, I realized. The yeah, mafia française. Mafia française, exactly, exactly absolutely. Um, so yeah, that, you know, I started from there. But yeah, went there, met a bunch of people. And something that really did help was I already had an, a running investing syndicate in France. Right. Had I gone there at the very beginning with just hopes and dreams, like, oh, I want to invest, I want to do this and that, yeah. people wouldn't take me seriously. But I came in and I was like, you know, I've already, I'm already writing uh, 10 checks per year. At the time, it was roughly 150K per deal, yep. 10 times a year in French startups. And I said to everyone that I met, I want to bring money, give money to US startups. So some doors ended up opening for me because, you know, startups are looking to fundraise. So that's how I approached, that's how, that's how it happened.
Okay, so you've become one of the top investors in the Y Combinator network, and you spend a lot of time talking to um, startups about something called product market fit, and we'll yes. come to that in a minute. How did you get involved with Y Combinator? It's a bit of... And why? And why. It's a bit of luck and a bit of persistence. I was trying to get on, get, uh, um, you know, in, get in, uh, into, into the, 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 the network, into the YC community for a long time, and I couldn't. It's very close. You can't get in. But I was very persistent and I was actually lucky enough that I had made an investment in a French company two years before that the company was accepted into YC. And YC doesn't accept a lot of companies outside of the US. So it was a very, very good startup. Can you say which company that was? Yeah, it's called Action Desk. Okay. Oh, I know them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I was good friends with Jonathan because I was helping him uh, acquire customers and getting to product market fit. Yeah. Which we'll come to. And... He became good friends with a bunch of YC partners okay. and he actually vouched for me. He said, okay, Gabriel is really the real deal. He's investing decent amounts of money. He's helping founders. So that's how I was able to get into the YC network. Okay, so for people that don't know, just could you explain a little bit about what Y Combinator is and sure. why it's important? Sure. Yeah. Y Combinator is the biggest startup incubator in the world. Startup incubator helps startup grow faster. And I believe it was one of the first to employ the model it employs, it, right? It is one of the first. I think it was started in 2004. Yeah. It's in San Francisco. Um, and it has a very specific method uh, with a lot of um, coaching from alumni that come back and help the new uh, people. It's a very intense program. It's 24-7 for three months. Yeah. Um, and my understanding is they select from something like a thousand or two thousand people to apply for the program. Maybe ten percent get in or less. No, no, it's much more than that. There's tens of thousands of startups that apply each year. Yeah, and they select less than one percent. And the ones that get uh, that, so that's very, very strict it's selection criteria. Super strict. And the ones that get in, I understand that they get a lump sum of investment, like a hundred or two hundred k. That YC takes, say, a seven percent stake in the yes. in the startup. Or YC takes seven percent. They used to give them at the beginning it was fifty k. Then it went to one fifty k. Today it's five hundred k that you get. Wow. Still seven percent. When did it go to five hundred k? Last year. Amazing. That's yeah. a lot of money. It is. Yeah. And yeah. so, what do they do with those startups then? And they. So YC has earned the reputation of being the best incubator because they incubated some very, very famous Silicon Valley startups. Uh, yeah. The most famous are Airbnb, Stripe, Coinbase, Dropbox, DoorDash, Twitch, Reddit, etc. And so household names these days. Sorry? Household oh, yeah, names yeah, yeah, these yeah, days. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, and so the, the program is, for me, I characterize it as a brainwash. Yes. <laughs> in, the, in the positive sense. Yeah. Uh, but there, the main thing is... Uh, their mantra is make something people want. Mm. And so they are all about getting product market fit or getting something in front of a customer that a customer is ready to pay for. Yeah. And that's what every startup should do. I think they are really right into their philosophy. Uh, there's so many people who spend, so many entrepreneurs spend a lot of time on things that are not as essential, not that they're futile, yeah. but getting customers is what every business is doing. Well, it's about making a mean, some meaningful progress with technology but also combining that with something that actually that people actually want. So it's and the speed. And, it's about speed as well. And speed as well. Yeah, you're right. Which which actually the training program and the funding helps with. And also, yeah. you know, because when you come out of YC, you've got access to a big funding network and you've got yeah. the reputation associated with being a YC startup. Then actually, you have that advantage as well. That's true. But but they want you to accelerate even before. But I think, and we'll come back to this in a minute. That combination of marketing and sales skills and technical prowess for sure is really the thing to me that defines it's got to be at the nub of any startup that's going to be successful and it's one of the reasons why i think the combination of technical plus sales and marketing founder is a really strong one absolutely sometimes you find those things those two things in the same person but it's but it's quite rare but i understand they 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 put people through this boot camp process so they take them off for like an eight week or ten week whatever it is program to actually just teach them how to start a startup yeah. as well. And that's, that's part of the whole exactly. running thing as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Three months, yeah. Okay. So you get yourself, what, an introduction to YC? Yeah. And how, how did that work? How did that develop? There's this list, this VIP list. Right. That gets invited to the demo day. So after the three months, there's something called a demo day yeah. where the startups present in front of a floor of investors. Yes. They show what they've accomplished in three months and where they're at. And almost all of them are actually raising at that point because it's yeah. perfect timing. Everyone's looking at them. It's time to raise. And 
once again, impossible to get on that list. Yeah. Impossible. So after Jonathan made the introduction, I got the email. You're invited to the next demo day. Okay. And that so was that was just a question of knowing somebody who was on yeah, the inside. Being on the list. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. So that must have been a big, for you, must have felt like a big sort of step. When did that happen? The first demo day was August 2020. Right. It was a, a huge break. Huge break for me. Changed my life. Yeah. Yeah. And what have you done with YC since then? 30 something investments, $18 million in total. Okay. But I, I'm aware also that you've got involved with a lot of YC startups in yes. terms of coaching them and That's helping them. So, and, and so just can we explore that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, YC deals, I quickly realized, are super competitive. So I, I came in, right? This yeah. f- new uh, young bird fresh out of the, out of the shell. Oh, hello, it's me. I want to invest in your startup. Well, actually, that's not how it works because there's thousands of investors who are battling to get into those rounds yeah. because a lot of people know that those are the best startups in the world, the most promising. So you got to have yourself, uh, make yourself a, a spot in those rounds. So at the beginning, I was, you know, talking to startups, committing capital to them like, okay, Evan, I want to invest, you know, 200K. Actually, they turned me down. <laughs> which is already in itself something pretty new because because they had an offer from a better investor exactly right? somebody had, else who they they were like we it's from I don't know Sequoia we want exactly those, we want those guys on a they have they have too much money offered to them so a typical YC startup will usually have between two and four times too much money offered to it as it wants to raise so they're in a position to say actually I want that investor not yeah. that one and so and so you know I was the new guy no one knew me so like nope sorry and so um, I quickly realized okay getting the intro is good. But now I got to do better than that. So at the beginning, I was probably getting knocked off one deal out of two that I was trying to make. Oh, roughly 50% were saying no. And they were the best ones, obviously. Yeah. And so my lucky break came because very early, I made two investments that were not super popular. They were kind of counterintuitive. So they were not super popular inside the YC community. Most people were thinking this is maybe not a good deal, but they both turned out to be exceptional. What were they? Bic, okay. at the time it was called BKE. Okay. It's Shopify for India. Okay. And the other one uh, is called Oxygen. Okay. Is uh, Neo Bank for SMBs. Okay. So both of those businesses in the US or in the US. Okay. Both of those businesses, in the two years following my investments, grew incredibly quickly. So the investments were marked up. They got like new further investments yeah. rounds. The values of the business Huge. went up to what? To what sort of? Just give us, give me a, give uh, me roughly, an idea. roughly thirty x in in two years. Both of them. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, actually, and so have you exited either of those yet? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But you know, let's let's see. And what what sort of valuations are they at now in terms of, compared to the original valuation you invested at? Um, I mean, both of them are not unicorns yet. Okay. But could be uh, in a not so distant future. Okay. I mean, right now, it's uh, this question. I mean, they would probably already be without the, the, the you know, big dip in valuations. Yeah. Right now, valuations are terrible. So, you know. Yeah. No, we're going through a, a, a period of famine. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, you know. Which will be followed by a period of feasting. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, in a few years, once the valuations pick back up, they're going to. But yeah. So, right now, it's tough to answer this question. But we had Sequoia invest one year after us in BK. Wow. So, we invested. In 2020, in 2021, Sequoia comes in at a higher valuation. So that was, that was amazing. Yeah. And for anyone that doesn't know, Sequoia are one of the, the biggest and oldest venture capital firms in Silicon Valley. So if Sequoia come into an investment, that's a, that's a real vote of confidence and, and, and other investors tend to follow. And so the YC community is very small. Yeah. And so everyone knows about the companies that are actually growing quickly and making it. You know, once you get an investment from Sequoia, everyone hears about it. Yeah. And so... The first year, no one knew me, and I did those two deals. I was lucky enough to get a spot. But the next year, everyone was like, oh, you're the guy who invested in BK and Oxygen. Okay. We want you, we want you on the cap table. So that built your reputation as an oh, investor, yeah. making those two really good investments. Super quickly. And, you know, that's two out of maybe 10 that I did. You know, the others didn't make it as well, but you don't care. And start investing, as long as you do have winners, yeah. the, 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 the other ones don't really matter. Well, so, that's the thing, though, isn't it? I mean, and I think... One of the things that people, when they look at these kind of investments and think that's really risky, what they don't understand is that in order to be successful, you need to have portfolio diversification. You need to have a certain minimum number because you have to count on a proportion of them failing. 
What's really interesting- Other, about, Otherwise it's too much risk. And, and, and some of them will fail. It's, it's an obligation. There is no escaping it. What's really fascinating with startup investing, it's one of the only investments, type of investment where if three quarters of everything you invest in goes to zero, and you can still make a lot of money. Super counterintuitive. But if you invest in real estate and half of your properties goes to zero, you're in deep trouble. Two completely different investment classes. Yeah. And you know, you don't you can invest in three or four properties. If if, if it's not property development is different, property investment, you can invest in three or four properties, you're never gonna lose all your money. Exactly. Uh, the very worst case is the market might go, go down and a bit. If, if you if, do if you're in it for the problem. if you're in it for the yeah. short term. But Startup investing completely different, and that whole portfolio diversification piece is super important. That's why people in, invest in syndicates and invest in venture capital funds because they can offer that portfolio that diversification risk and risk absolutely. amelioration, and also that close management of the investments that, that's needed to ensure that uh, a they're selected carefully, and b that as much value is added to them to increase their chances of success. That's essentially what, absolutely. in my mind, venture capital is about. Yeah, anyway, we jump ahead. Um, so, so that gave you a bit of reputation, reputation with the network. And then I started helping them a lot. Yeah. So how did, how did that transition into starting helping happen? Well, I mean, the few first investments that you make, then once you're an investor, they're going to come to you and ask you questions. Okay. I was a founder. I had one exit at the time, now two. So you were helping the companies you'd, you'd invested in and giving them advice about what? Mostly growth. Mostly, mostly how to find customers. Everything that I could help them with. I did a lot of things in all of my previous startups on the wine business. I don't know about SEO, so I t taught them this. I had a YouTube channel uh, from 2017, so I taught them about social media. So you were super strong on digital marketing and social media marketing, effectively. Yeah. That's the thing that you were helping with them. A lot of other things, getting, you know, uh, um, uh, getting B2B sales. Uh, when I was doing the e-learning business, I did a lot of B2B sales. Uh, um, um, cold outreach, whether email or even on the, on the phone, something I didn't mention. To get my wine website going, yeah. I called 40,000 wine producers in France, one by one. And how many of those did you end up selling wine for? 150. Wow. Okay. So that's... Over two a, years, right? Over two years, I so, called 40,000. Yeah. So, and I learned how to, how to you know, I A-B tested my scripts, etc. Then I ran a lot of webinars, not for the wine producers, but for the uh, e-learning. So I was learning a lot of, about webinars and how to run a webinar successfully. I've run hundreds of webinars in my life. So I was teaching this to the companies, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's something on the Y, on the y community that provides a lot of technology for their startup. One thing they provide is called Bookface. It's a tool that only YC companies can access where every investor is rated. So they can say, oh, Evan invested in me and this was really good. He helped me with this and that, or you know, this person invested in, in me, but he actually didn't provide any value, couldn't reach him, et cetera. So I was new in this environment, I wanted to prove uh, my value and my, my worth. So, you know, I was always available, always trying to help and very quickly got very high rating ratings on that platform. And so after a few years of, and you know, YC is a very small community. So even if I talk to a founder that I actually don't end up investing in him, I always offer to help. I always give immediate feedback in the call. They told me this and this and that. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to invest because I think your customer acquisition is not there yet, but actually something you could explore is doing this and this and that. I've done it before in my previous businesses. It worked really well. If you want, we can take some time apart and do it together, etc. So my reputation grew like this as well. Um, and that also helps me today get deals done. So even if you weren't investing, you would do everything you could to offer value and actually yeah. try and help the startup. Yeah, absolutely. Progress. Still do today. Yeah, great. It's funny. I, I do this all the time. I don't know why people don't. It, it, right now we're in an event. Yeah. I met this guy. Yeah. Uh, he was looking for an investor. I actually introduced him to you. Yes. And after I told him, oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have done this like that. You, you actually increased your chances if you did it like that. I'm not gaining anything out of it. It's just, you know, and the guy, and I saw in his eyes, he saw, yeah. he told me, thank you so much. Yeah. He's like, that's so cool. You're, you're, you're direct. You're helping me. And I, I don't care. I just made him happy. It took me yeah. two minutes of my life. Exactly. And you know what? I think when you've, when you've been around the block a few times and you've seen a few companies, and actually, when you're seeing it from an investor's perspective, it's different. And I know, and I guess it's the same for you. You've seen it from the perspective of someone operating a business and somebody investing in a business. It is a different perspective. For and sure. when you start to look at it from an investor's perspective, you see angles that entrepreneurs don't see. But I think probably, like me, you get an immense amount of just personal satisfaction out of being able to help people if you can. And why not? Sure. I mean, I think... 
at the end of the day, we're, we're kind of all in this together, we're in life together. Yeah. If we can help each other in small ways, it's a great thing, even if, and money is not the only thing. In fact, for sure, you could argue your money is, is the kind of the mm-hmm. thing that you need to water the plant, right? The plant needs water to survive, but it isn't necessarily the most important thing. Yeah. You know, it might be where you put the plant in the first place or or what else you do with it. It's, it's very interesting. You know, I do think that my, I, I, I had a very interesting relationship with money because for the longest time when I was young, I was chasing it yeah. because it was a measure of my success. Yeah. And when I got some success and I got some money, immediately realized it was worthless. I mean, money is good. It gives you a little bit of comfort. You go on vacation to a nice hotel. You, but, so a few th- first of all, you realize you don't need to be a gazillionaire to have nice vacation. You know, you, yeah. you make, even with little money, if you're scrappy enough, but very quickly you realize it's, it, it's meaningless. What has meaning is meeting people, uh, you know, doing stuff that matters. And for me personally, it's family. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's meaningful when you don't have enough of it. It can cause problems when you don't have exactly. enough of it. Exactly. Money solves money problems. But when you get to the point where you, where you don't need it, then it, you realize it doesn't make you happy. Yeah. And so actually, for me, being able to help people in those small ways and just, you know, like as you said, seeing the kind of gratitude in that guy's mm-hmm. eyes when you, when you helped him out and it cost, you know, it, you didn't have to do it. It cost you nothing. Yeah. To me, that's the reward in and of itself. Yeah, and so if you can do that, there's, you know, that's worth more than, than anything yeah, money and, can buy. And by the way, this is how you build your reputation as well. I mean, the next time this guy hears about something, it's like, oh, wow, I met this guy, Gabriel. He's super, you know, uh, uh, precise in what he's, I, I don't know, he's going to think of me for something else. So, you know, it's even, I'm not doing it for this, obviously, but it's actually a smart move as well. Yeah, yeah it is. It is, I agree. Um, so you have ended up specializing and something called, and in particular in helping startups in the YC network, was something called product market fit. Yeah. Can you explain what product market fit is? Or achieving product market fit? Achieving product market fit. So I personally call this traction, but it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. It's make something people want, is how YC calls it. It's basically once your startup is actually able to deliver exactly value that a customer is interested in and is ready to buy at that price. So, you know, if your um, there's this joke or whatever, like if you're a, a, a food truck selling pizza or burgers or whatever, the best place for you to be is outside of a nightclub at 4 a.m. Yeah. So everyone comes out, is drunk and is super hungry. So this is what the startup wants to achieve. Uh, but if, when it's on the digital world, you, you, it's not about where you put your food truck. It's about customer acquisition and the value that you offer. And if you're an app, there's millions of apps. So how do you... Uh, uh, you know, how, how does your app differentiate and attract customer? What value does it actually provide so that people use it, buy it, and it's kind of a snowball effect of more and more and more and more people are using it? Yeah. So look, I've seen a few definitions of product market fit. And one of them is that when you get to the point where customers say that they can't do without yeah. your product. So in other words, if you, you give it to somebody and they use it and then you take it away and they're like, oh, I need that, I can't do without it. That's a very That's good fine. definition, yeah. Another one is the one that you referred to earlier, which is traction. And so if you were trying to establish that a company had, had achieved product market fit via traction, what would you look for? I mean, it's uh, always uh, case by case, right? But the big trends, I mean, if you want to put it into numbers or something to look for specifically, I'd say over 30% of monthly growth for at least three months and for something more than cents or, you know, a few, like if you're going from $5 to $8 to $12, yes, you're growing. So for a significant, it doesn't have to be millions, but for something in between, something significant enough. Yeah. And if you have at least 30% for three months yeah, and it's repeatable yeah, or somehow automated, then this is starting to look like traction. Uh, if you look really by the numbers. So that's going to equate probably in terms of revenue growth to doubling or maybe quadrupling annually, something like that probably? Um, you can make it, yeah, if you do 30% per month for 12 months, that's, I think, yeah, between tripling and quadrupling, something like this. Yeah. Mm, okay. And how much, so you, you would want to see a minimum of three months worth of that before you, yeah. you concluded. And that, and that, I'm guessing that sort of minimum is going to be 
you know, ideally you want to see six or nine months. Oh, for sure. Or more. For sure. Yeah. And the thing is, no, nobody sustains this for 10 years. It's impossible. No yeah. one ever has. Yeah. But if you're able to sustain it for two plus years, for sure you're going to have a great company. Well, so, so you know, when you achieve product market fit, the startup sort of goes through this burst phase where they grow super quick and then inevitably it will start to level off because nobody can grow at that rate forever. So, I mean, achieving this thing, this kind of burst of activity, of growth activity, is something that a lot of startups never get to. Absolutely. The ones that fail it never get It is super difficult. And it's a, it's a really critical point because at yeah. the point that you achieve that, you can start to raise significantly more money. Oh, for sure. You know, so you, that's, that point is what some people would call late seed or maybe series A stage. So when you first started, perhaps that seed slash late, late seed, when you've really got it established and it's clear, you're, you're probably into series A in terms of funding. You help startups understand how to get to product market yeah, fit. Absolutely. And you're good at it. I know you're good at it because I've seen you do it. Mm-hmm. I've seen you do it with some of the companies that I'm working with. What I'd like you to try and explain, because you and I talked about this before the um, before this conversation, and you said to me yourself that it's something of an art, not necessarily a science. You sort of know it when you see it, but maybe you can't quite sure. exactly explain it. But what I'd like you to do it. is explain <laughs> to the extent that you can, Yeah. when you work with a startup and you're trying to help them achieve product market fit, and they haven't, you know, because they just can't seem to get that traction. They're sort of bouncing along, bit of revenue up and down, but you're not quite there. How do you help them through that process? What steps do you go through? What are the practical <laughs> steps that you work through to get them from A to hopefully product market fit, A to B? Yeah. yeah. So you're right. I haven't, you know, uh, I don't have a, a specific method written that is, it's more in my head. But if I try to f- kind of formalize it, I mean, let's go with examples because every company, there's types of companies that are different. It depends if it's B2C, B2B. But the first thing that I want is for it to be repeatable. Uh, oh, okay, before that, you want to make sure that the customer has value. I, I just mentioned that before. Mm-hmm. Like it's something that like, people actually want. And, you know, you can, um, for instance, YC really asks the founders to talk with the customers all the time. This EO spends an hour every day talking with these customers to really understand what they want, what they need, what they like, what they don't like, etc. So you got to make sure that what you're creating is really what people want. That's the first thing. Then it's about repeatability. If you have the best product, but no one hears about it, so, I mean, okay, first of all, it's about reaching your customers before repeatability. If you have the best product, but no one knows about it, then, you know, there's this uh, uh, thing, I think it's from Warren Buffett, would you rather be the best lover, but everyone thinks you're the worst lover, or be the worst lover, but I, everyone thinks you're the best lover? So, if you have the best product, but no one hears about it, you know... You got a problem. You, n- nothing's going to ever happen, right? So, it's first about... But also, you know, you could have a huge problem if everyone tries your product and they're disappointed, right? So, exactly. Yeah. So, the first thing is have a product that people want. The next thing is putting it in front of other people. So, this is very, you know, a very broad topic. But basically, B2C, getting in front of users, it's social media, influencer campaigns, ads... Uh, SEO, every kind of online, most, most of the time it's online marketing. I actually have a Mexican startup that I invested into. They don't do online marketing. They go into the market in Mexico City uh, when people are grocery shopping and they hand out flyers. And this is how they acquire customers. Right. Um, you know, uh, Airbnb is famous because at the beginning, every Airbnb uh, um, place was automatically posted on, on Craigslist. Right. Right? Or you have the viral loops, the famous PS I love you from Hotmail, that every time you send an email, it creates a viral loop. So how do you put it in front of the eyes of the customer? It's a kind of growth hacking thing, right? Yeah, it can. The, the, the PS I love you is a growth hacking thing. It doesn't have to be growth hacking. I mean, it can be as simple as a Facebook ad. If you have a good unit economics, your ad is very cheap. It converts. Yeah. You actually make more money from the customer right away. Yeah, it needs to be a repeatable flywheel. Exactly needs to be repeatable. That's the main word. And so what to look for? I use the word flywheel deliberately because the whole point... Self-reinforcing, right? It, yeah, the, as, you, as the flywheel spins up, it goes faster, so it accelerates. It, that's even better. But even if it's not a flywheel, it's just something scalable. Yeah. 
So I'll give, I'll give you an example. Um, I have, I was just an hour ago talking to one of my uh, startup that they're growing 60% per month. Wow. It's um, a banking app in a very specific market. Yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's a banking app for Latinos in, in the US. Okay. So there's 65 million Latinos in the US mm -hmm. and they have their own specific needs, uh, sending money back home, yeah. um, um, uh, grouping money together. That's something they have in their culture that Americans don't, et cetera. Okay. They're doing 60% per month. There's like, they don't even need to be a flywheel as long as they attract that many customers and grow so quickly. Even if it's not self-reinforcing, if the entrance of the pipe is, has enough people coming in, it's enough, right? If it's a flywheel, it's even better. Yeah, but it sounds to me like this is something that's just spreading in the Latino community because it's 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 yeah that's true it so works for them and so they just the flywheel is that they're it's social they're just talking to there's it. always a flywheel with recommendation word of mouth so no you're right so anyway it needs to be repeatable and so what to what to avoid is someone and there's so many startups and especially in the B two B space B two B is more difficult I guess to have repeatability and automation. Because so many people, they create a B2B business and I ask them, okay, you got how many customers? Five. Awesome. Congratulations. You have traction. It's growing. How did you get them? Oh, I did email outreach and my personal network and LinkedIn. Okay. How does that grow to a thousand customers? Answer. It doesn't. So this is a trick. They get the first five customers. It grows, gets people to invest. And then right away, one month after the investment, the company flatlines. Because they don't have a repeatable process for scaling exactly. the business. Exactly. If you want the company to become a unicorn, which is yeah. usually your goal, even in B2B, it needs to have thousands of customers. Yeah. And so it's going to be, it's going to require to go much further out of the founder's network. So it sort of feels to me like the first step in the process for your evaluation is, is this, is this a product that's attractive to the market? That's, mm -hmm. you know, and... And then the second step is, is there this repeatable process that can be employed to actually scale the thing? But the first one feels to me like it's a, quite a subjective evaluation. You know, it's you looking at it saying, do I think this really works or not? No, that's or not. not. No, that's not. No, okay. It's not. Actually, the market tells me. Right. If they're growing for months and months and months, it means the, the market wants it. Okay. But what if the problem is that they don't have this repeat, repeatable flywheel and not the product? How do you know which one is which? Well, I mean, if they don't have the repeatable flywheel, I'll ask them how they got the customers. I'll see it's not repeatable. Yeah. It's very easy to ascertain. Yeah, no, but I guess what I'm saying is how do you know when it's a marketing problem and when it's not a product problem oh, or yeah. vice versa? I, I, uh, you're right. It could be that they have the right selling process, but actually the product is shit. Yeah, or vice versa. Uh, vice versa. I, 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 you don't know. I don't know. I don't care. Okay. I, I won't invest anyway. Right. Right? You no, know, you're right. It could be that the product but, is bad. But if you want to help them... You could have, I mean, you have usually an intuition after doing this for so many years. You can very easily, I, I talked to a guy today. Oh my God, I hope he's not watching this. He's, 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 do, let's not say what he's doing. Okay. But anyway, I looked at this thing and I'm like, I, immediately I'm like, this is useless. Like I don't, no one, no one needs this. I know so many companies. I know yeah. what they need. I know what they pay for, what they use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his thing, I was like, yeah. Do I know any company who would pay for this? So I... You know, I see hundreds of startups, so I have Yeah, no, I have that intuition as well. The intuition is not always right. But, That's true. But it's but right so most prove of the time. So prove me wrong it's, with sales. It's, it's, it's right, exactly. It's right most of the time. No, the, 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 it's interesting to, to know that intuition is wrong often, and that's okay. Mine, yours, I think everyone is. And I want to be proven wrong by the market. Yeah. Many times I've seen an entrepreneur and I was like, this is, really? This works? People are buying this? I was amazed. Like, I, I wouldn't think. Yeah. But prove it to me by the numbers. And the guy in question I'm telling you about that I met today, yeah. his sales are zero. So I'm like, okay, maybe I'm right. Yeah. But well, so, yeah, there's some nuances there. I think you're right. I, I often come across things that I'm surprised by. People actually buy that. I didn't, yeah. didn't ever think people would. But exactly. when you've got this problem situation where sales aren't growing, Often the product needs tweaking, I find. It's possible. And, but sometimes the problem is, is that they're just not marketing it the right way. Yeah. And so I suppose in a way what you're trying to do is figure out where the problem is and just kind of clear the blocks out. Yeah. And in a way, if you can solve one problem, then you can figure out it must be the other thing. Absolutely. And Absolutely. it probably is just those two things, isn't it? Or can it be something else? Ah, it can be many things. 
it can be other things. It can be that the 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 especially if it's a B2B sales process, it can be that the the, um, the founders are not good salespeople. Right. Uh, that happens a lot. There's two tech founders and they're just not, just not good at sales. It's just not good at all. They have the demos, but they're just not converting. Yeah. Um, it can be that there's a pricing problem. So the product is good. The consumers do want the solution, but if it's too expensive, they're not going to buy it. If it's too cheap, they're not going to buy it either because they don't trust that it's a solution. Yeah, or because so this, if they're trying to sell something that's critical to the company, but it's too cheap, they might think it's it's just going to break. Or or even the pricing is not set up properly, so it's a yeah. subscription, but people don't want a subscription, or it's a one time off and they want a one time off, or it's a commission based, but people don't want to pay commission, they want to pay flat fee. Like there's a lot of other possibilities. And um, and how do you how do you figure that stuff out? Is it just you just say always, just do a bit of A B testing? Yeah, exactly. It's always the same thing, and I tell them, have you tried selling it, it that way? Like, this is very basic, yeah. but sometimes they haven't thought of trying. So, you know, like, oh, have you tried selling it as a subscription? I, this happened to me today as well. They're like, oh, uh, do you do affiliate links? No, okay. Uh, how much money are you making? Oh, you're not making money. Okay, try affiliate links. And they're like, oh, my God, the, the founder was like, no, no one ever suggested this to me ever. I was like, well, now they have. Go try it. Yeah. And I'm not saying I'm right. Maybe, I'm, it, maybe it's, it's no, lame, but, but try it. Well... The market will tell you. So we talked earlier, we touched earlier on the inspector perspective versus the entrepreneur perspective. And I think the advantage of doing what we do is that you see what everyone does. Exactly. You see all the different things that different people do. And so you know all the techniques that exist. Exactly. And when you see someone that's not employing them, you can say, well, have you tried that? Exactly. And that, yeah, that in some ways, I think, is part of the value that investors can bring. They can take the lessons that they learn from Elsewhere. one or other business yeah. they've been involved with and say, you know, why don't you try this? And that and that goes for a whole host of things for startups, you know, not just product market fit from how they deal with their investors. Absolutely. How they hiring. How, all of that all yeah. of that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And all the things that you need actually to, to scale a startup. And I suppose you learned a lot of those skills when you were running your syndicate and I, and I guess now that you're running a venture capital your own venture capital firm, you're you've taken those skills and and, and you're able to transfer them and hone and tune what you do and do it even better. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So the next question I'd like to ask you is about your investment approach. In other, words, in other words, how do you evaluate startups and what are the criteria you use when you are looking at an investment and, and trying to make a decision as to whether you're going to invest or not? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, uh, this is a, a, very, a process that I think about a lot because it's my job. It's what I do on a daily basis. And there's a lot of things to, that goes into that answer. So, you know, I could spend two, the next two hours explaining this to you, but um, uh, if I want to sum it up and if I want to go to the essentials, the number one thing for me is early traction. So I'm a seed investor. So most uh, people sometimes say to me, oh, you're doing seed, but you want traction. That doesn't make sense. Um, most startups in seed haven't achieved traction. First of all, what do I mean by traction? Traction is growth in revenue numbers in terms of dollars for at least two, three months, ideally more, and exponentially. So it's growing, you know, not linearly, but exponentially. So most startups are not able to achieve this uh, at the seed stage, and I'm looking for the, for the rare startups that do. Uh, that's really the number one thing. And the reason, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. So I was going to say, so going back to that product market fit point that we talked about earlier. Exactly. And when you look for that, what evidence do you ask the startups to provide how deep do you go in terms of your your dd on that um i mean because because you know every startup will say yeah we're growing fast but you have to look at what's really yeah, happening right absolutely i mean it, uh, the good thing is it comes down to the dollars i'm looking at the amount of money so you know i just ask them how much did you make last month how much do you, are you making this month so but do, you ask them for, do you ask them for a spreadsheet showing monthly revenues do you look at their bank statements yeah in, absolutely, in some cases, yeah. When there's doubt, the good thing with uh, when there is doubt, I mean, if there or is doubt, there's lack of clarity, perhaps. Exactly. Yeah. But the good thing is, I'm only investing in YC, right? So yeah. there's an amount of trust already in there that's pretty big, because yeah. YC vets them, because YC teaches them how to do that, and there's no real incentive to be lying. I'm I'm, I'm looking out for that anyway. Some companies are kind of trafficking or, or, or changing the numbers. And that's obviously a huge red flag, yeah. but it's very, very rare. 
And yes, I do have due diligence. I'm saying either bank statements or, you know, uh, Stripe dashboards or anything. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess if you sense any lack of clarity about something when you're in discussions with the founders, then you would go to that next level of um, DD. Oh, for sure. And, and or, or pass automatically. If, if something's not, doesn't feel right, yeah. you know, you can, you can feel it. Because I talk to so many startups, you can feel very easily if the founder knows what he's talking about. And I, you can see if the answers doesn't match each other. If there's one answer that's this number and the other answer is this number and you make the math in your head and you're like, that's, this doesn't add up, yeah. you feel some things, you know, um, yeah. not looking right. And I guess the more you do it, you, the more you get used to that, that process. And so traction is a key thing. What else? So the number one thing is traction. And the reason is you want to invest in a startup at one point in time and you want the startup to be bigger later down the road. And so... If it has traction, the company is already growing. It's already almost uh, betting on the on the on the race after the after it's finished. Because you already know this company is growing. So that's the number one thing. The second thing in 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 terms of importance for me, I mean, first of all, you got to cover the basics. So the team, uh, the fact that they're you know honest and 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 uh, smart and ambitious. So that's kind of you know the basis. But it's then, gotta be a given. Sorry, those things have to be a given. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's like you know you know I don't even. Talk about them because everyone has that. Yeah. That's not very original. Uh, traction then becomes the most important. The, the, the next thing for me is repeatability of the traction. So you need to see some form of flywheel that can accelerate a repeatable exactly. process. Exactly. And what about the founders themselves? I mean, how closely do you look at the, the qualities of the founding team? Very closely. Uh, once again, luckily for me, YC does a lot of the work for me. Uh, because they're one one of their biggest selection criteria is the team. I'm looking at you know if there's um, two or more founders and they're compl- you know how how uh, they how they complement each other. So if there's a tech founder and a, a sales guy or something, I'm looking. Of course, everyone. That's, that's a good combination in your view. Yeah. Okay. Uh, CEO and a CTO. And what if there's one founder? What do you look for? One founder is rare uh, that I invest in them uh, unless they're very credible, unless they're repeat founder, they've sold the business. So I'm also looking at repeat founders. Uh, I think all investors are. It's a great sign if someone already has created and if someone already sold a company, that they already know what they're doing. The learning curve at the beginning is huge. So they've already won through it. Yes, yes. So if there's I, just one person, it's less likely that I'm going to invest. Yeah. So on a first time startup, it's probably a founder team of two. Ideally, or three or four. Yeah. Although I guess the more people, the more chance there is of some disagreement. Exactly. Again. So, you, so, so but I mean, I, I would have thought the sweet spot would be two. Would you agree or not? Uh, no, it could be three. Uh, two or three is the sweet spot. Four, five, six isn't necessarily an issue if they work together well. Yeah. And the good thing is if one of them drops out, it doesn't kill the business. Yeah. If there's two of them, if one of them drops out, most likely it kills the business. Yeah. So... But yeah, the sweet spot is two or three. Yeah, or if it's a solo founder, then that's probably going to have to be that solo founder's second startup. Most likely, exactly, exactly. But YC accepts very few solo founders anyway. Interesting. Yeah, Okay. for that reason. Okay, and anything else in terms of investment criteria? Yes, there's many, many more, but on the, on the most important list, once a company has traction, it's actually repeatable and scalable, so you know they have everything in place to grow to keep company to keep that company growing bigger and bigger and bigger and they have the right team with the right people they're honest they're ambitious they're not you know uh, fuzzy with the numbers everything makes sense then i go to the next biggest thing for me which is unfair advantage yes and unfair advantage is i think defensibility uh, what warren buffett calls a moat uh, basically if your startup is successful it's going to be copied it's going to be replicated yeah. Uh, sometimes by Google, by the GAFAs, or by, by someone with more money. Mm. So how defensible is your product? What's unique about you and your team and your vision and the way you do it that makes that in the end you're going to be the winner? Mm. Because every startup gets, is, is, is copied. You know, Uber came out and everybody now is doing a taxi uh, on-demand app. There's Lyft in the US and there's, I don't know, at least three competitors in, in, in Europe and, and there's Grab in Southeast Asia and Didi in China, etc. So how is Uber going to win in the end? So do you look for market dominance? Is that sufficient in terms of unfair competitive advantage or does it have to be stronger than that? I mean, uh, it sometimes can be enough, 
but it never happens to me because I'm investing in seed. No one is already dominating their market in seed. No, but they, they could be have potential to dominate a sector. Oh, yeah. Be first in the sector. Yeah, yeah. Is that enough for you? For, it, it depends. Most often it isn't. First mover advantage has been you know proven time and time again to not be enough, right? Yeah. Uh, it could, if a company is so much ahead and growing so quickly that it's impossible to catch up, yeah. it could be. But it's, most often it's not the case. Um, and I guess particularly not at seed stage. That, that would be more likely at Series A or maybe Series B stage. BC, you could see clear leaders. And you know, there's also sometimes where there's no winner takes all. Yes. So if the company is not the only one on the market, it can still make it big. Yeah. And so in that area, the unfair advantage is more of making sure it's going to become big, even if there's others, not to make sure there's going to be the only one. Okay, so if it's mostly not market dominance, what are the key things you look for? There's thousands of things, and it's different for every company. The most obvious one is patents that defend the, you know, the tech, but in software, patents don't exist. It's almost well, nowhere to be found. And the other problem is if you publish a patent, everyone can see it, so they can then find a, uh, another way to do the same thing. So there's trade so secrets. So sometimes you can be giving away yeah. your secret, right? Exactly. So there's trade secrets where you do something, you don't have a patent, but yeah. no one knows how you're doing it. That's the Coca-Cola recipe, right? So that's one thing. Something that's uh, very famous at YC is what do the founders have realized or what do they know that no one else does? Yeah. The best example of this is Airbnb. Everybody thought they were crazy. All the investors at the beginning said, you're insane. I'm never going to go sleep at someone else's house that I don't know. Yeah. But the founders, they knew if, because they, they, they saw it on their platform. If you have ratings and if you have professional photography of the place, people are actually ready to do it. That's why at the beginning of Airbnb, they were sending for free a professional photographer to your place to take professional pictures of your place. They knew if the pictures were good and the ratings were good, people were actually going to do it. And it happened. But they were the only one to have figured it out initially. So that's something really good. You know, um, uh, what have you figured out that no one else has? There's the, the team in itself. Is the team is a repeat founder? Or if the team is an ex-big uh, company, you know, if you're doing a self-driving car thing and you're an ex-Tesla guy, yeah. then obviously you're better equipped than most people to do that. Yeah. There's, um, there's speed. We mentioned that, right? If you're, the, if, if, you're, if you're so much ahead than anyone else. And the last thing, there's funding as well. Yeah. If you're able to raise more, if you're able to outraise all of your competitors, you're going to outspend them on marketing. And being at YC is really good to raise more. Well, that's true. You know, at YC, you do get the attention of the large VC firms, and you're more likely to be able to uh, uh, attract the, the um, large amounts of capital that you need to scale quickly. And so, I guess YC ca um, startups have a uh, an advantage in, in in that respect as well. And I think going back to the point that we talked about earlier in terms of um, being open-minded, really, I suppose, is, is what it is. Um, just because you don't think something will work doesn't mean it won't work. Absolutely. Sometimes the most interesting ones are the ideas that prove us wrong. We, th we think that won't work, but actually it does. And, it's, and the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If you see the traction and it's there exactly. and you see some competitive advantage, well, maybe you've got to change your mind. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I love being wrong. First of all, I love it for the entrepreneurs yeah. to prove me wrong. It means yeah. they succeeded. So that's awesome. Yeah. And I think it's very important to keep what I would call a post-mortem. So companies that you passed on, you didn't believe in, yeah. but they actually make it big. And I have a very funny story on this. I actually said no to SoRare. SoRare is the biggest French unicorn. So it's a, you know, a crypto, NFT, uh, soccer, collectibles thing, a game online. Mm -hmm. And the founder, you know, came to me and offered me to invest. Yeah. And I said no uh, for several reasons, right? And if I, he wanted me to invest 150K. Mm -hmm. If I did, those 150K today would be worth 213 million euros. Wow. 213 million euros. So that's I a big said, mistake. It's, a, it's <laughs> but probably, uh, to date, probably the biggest of my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's fine. I did a YouTube video on it. I, it was a post-mortem of like, why did I say no? Why were the reasons? Yeah. And would I do it again today, knowing what I know? And the funny thing is, if the same situation was presenting itself today, I would still say no. I think I was right to say no at the time. This is very interesting to illustrate that my investment criteria is not a crystal ball. I can't predict the future. And I think it's all about the odds. Exactly. I, I, I'm, by saying no to companies like this that have a bigger chance of failing, yeah. I increase my odds of only selecting the best ones.
Yes, and I think founders need to bear that in mind. Just because A VC or A investor has turn, turned them down for investment doesn't mean they don't have a good idea. Absolutely. It just means it doesn't fit that. Absolutely, investor. and it's actually a good thing. Someone turned you down, now you've got a chip on your shoulder and you want to prove them wrong and go do it. And I always say to people, you know, I wish you the best. I truly do. Prove me wrong. I hope I'm wrong and I hope you make it big and I missed. Because, I mean, when, for me as an investor, I have other companies. If I missed this one, I missed so rare, I'm going to make millions somewhere, some other place for me and for my investors. Yeah. So, you know, I have other, but for this guy, for this business, he has only one shot It's his business. I mean, he can create another one later on, but this business is his only, only chance right now to make it big. So I wish for them to prove me wrong all the time. Great. Gabriel, we've had a great and wide ranging chat. You've just done first close on your first VC fund. Um, and you're starting to deploy capital there. I'd love to talk to you about that, but we don't have time today. So we'll, we'll keep, we'll save that for a part two. Sure. I just want to ask you a couple of questions in closing. And the first one is, what do you know now that you didn't when you started and what would you have done differently? Um, when I started, I was doing everything at the same time. I was piling startups and projects on top of each other, which I think is a huge mistake. I know now my limits. I know that I'm not a superhuman and that in order to do things well, you got to focus on few things. So I've eliminated a lot of the clutter in my life, including recently selling an old company that I had that just was, you know, a mental burden. Uh, I'm really trying to declutter my life professionally. And so I, uh, if I was younger, if I, you know, telling my, myself what to do, I would say, stop doing four companies at the same time. First of all, you look like an idiot because everyone that's, you know, has a little bit of experience knows that if you're creating four companies, you're doing nothing, yeah. basically. Uh, so that's really, I think, the main thing. And I've really decluttered my, my professional life and focused on one thing and do it right. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing I would say is do something that you love. My first businesses, we talked about them, you know, social media, wine, etc. They're not my deep passions. Yeah. I didn't really care about them. I was more opportunistic. But maybe you had to do them to discover what you love. Probably, probably. Yeah. But in any case, I think going after, in the, for, in, for example, going in the wine business where there's so many passionate people. I mean, I'm French. I love wine like the next French people. But it's, but, it's not, <laughs> but it's not my passion, right? So, and I was seeing other people that were so much more passionate than, than, than me about wine. So I think, you know, life is short. Uh, we don't know how much time we have on this uh, little blue rock that's called Earth. Yeah. So we might as well do something that you really, really, truly enjoy. Yeah, I think that's the whole point, isn't it? At the end of the day, the money is needed to make the thing work, but really, what's the point in doing it if you're not enjoying it? Exactly. We, we have to enjoy life. We're, not, we're here for a short time. Exactly. Gabriel, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. I've learned an enormous amount, and I'm sure that people listening to this have learned a lot as well, an enormous amount too. We need to bring this to a close, but is there anything else that you'd like to say or mention or just talk about um, before we sign off? I mean, I, we could briefly touch on reading. I mentioned this to you yeah. uh, off the podcast, and I thought you said you were interested in that. I am. So I, I've I've been uh, reading around fifty nonfiction books per year. Wow. For the past six, seven years. Okay, so tell me about some um, of the ones you really want to talk talk to people about. I, I, you know, I can, I could, I'm gonna g give a number of, of of books, sure, but even if if I don't say any book titles, the, the just you know, taking up that habit really changed my life. Yes. Um, and I, by nonfiction, I mean, you know, business books and how to, you know, per, anything goes that, you know, personal development or business or entrepreneurship or investing, everything. And just the habit, I mean, some books, you read them and you don't like them. Mm -hmm. But the few books that you read that have an impact on you are life changing. So there's, a, there's many, many that, that I, uh, that happened for me, even if you don't read 50, 50 is maybe extreme, yeah. but so, so few people read nowadays and I really did change my life. And so we really uh, encourage anyone here to start reading, even if it's five per year for the first year, and then the next year maybe 10, or you can do 12, right? It's one, one per month. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, the book that had the most impact on my life is The 4-Hour Workweek. Oh, by Tim Ferriss, okay. 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 Today, it doesn't mean much to me, but when I read it, I was 18. And yeah, yeah. It really did change my life, showed, showed me the way, et cetera, et cetera. There are some great lessons in that book. Yeah. Uh, I read it a long time ago, so I don't remember everything in it, but. You know, I, I think reading opens your mind. It gives you ideas. Yeah. I mean, I've read a couple of books recently, or listened to, I should say, by David Deutsch. One, one is The Beginning of Infinity. And, oh, yeah, I read that as well. Right. And it's really got, in some ways, not a lot to do with investing, but it gave me ideas. For sure. And I, and I think 
I don't know if that's the point you're making, but I think maybe it is. It just opens your mind to new possibilities it and does. things that you hadn't thought about. And yeah. the way I see reading is it allows you to directly plug your brain on someone else's brain. Yeah. And it's usually someone much smarter than you. That's why they wrote a book. So you're able to download content from, from someone so much smarter. Yeah. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Yeah. You know, so you're literally plugged on someone else's brain. So it's, it's fascinating. So, you know, the four hour work week today wouldn't, you know, bring me much, I guess. But at the time, uh, 15 years ago was, was huge. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would, uh, you know, I can only uh, recommend um, so many, yeah, there's so many books, but I, I can say Red Dalio. He's a very fascinating author, principles and everything else he's written since. And Nassim Nicholas Taleb for me is huge. Uh, the, the series of three, that's Black Swan, Anti-Fragile, and Skin in the Game, amazing. I mean, there's many more, but you know, yeah. this is a startup. You know, and I don't think Black Swan's his most interesting book. Um, there's a book that he's written about risk. The, the name escapes me. We'll put, the, we'll put the books in the show notes. You and I will have a little chat after this. We'll get a list of books sure. and we'll put the, them in the show notes. Sure. Um, but yeah, I agree. Nicholas Nassim Taleb is super interesting. And his ideas about risk, I think, are a lot what drives my investing philosophy. And I suspect what drives yours as oh, well. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. And I think, you know, another, another person that's really worth listening to that you... You, you mentioned yesterday is Naval Ravikant. He is yeah. uh, a very successful angel investor and he's spent a lot of time thinking about what he does. And Absolutely. Um, so I think- Fascinating guy. Yeah. He is a fascinating, fascinating guy. Yeah. All right, Gabriel, well, look, thank you for your time. Thank you for your wisdom and your thoughts. It's been, I've learned a lot. I've really enjoyed it. And I'm look for, looking forward to doing a round two. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to do round two anytime. And thanks for a great conversation. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> All right. See you soon. Bye.